Good morning. morning. Bit bit windy outside? Yeah? Oh, that's that's amazing. So is this what blew in? Is that how that works? Huh? So yeah, this morning I woke up and came down here and I didn't even have to start my car. I just lifted up my sail and right down Laurel. It was great. It was tough getting into the parking lot because I had to kind of tack back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It took me like 20 minutes. If you have no idea what that means, that's pretty funny, so laugh, all right? All right. So y'all good today? All right. So hey, uh, we're going to start uh, talking a little bit about jobs in a minute, uh, but I want to share a couple statistics with you guys first. Um, we're in a series called Family Matters in 2020, and the goal of this um, series is really to kind of pick out some top uh, topics, if you will, of areas that families kind of wrestle with, have a lot of questions about, just kind of struggle with, and so we're just kind of picking some of those based on you know my counseling and talking with many of you guys. So the first two weeks we looked at four ingredients of an uh, amazing or awesome family. And so if you missed any of those uh, two weeks, I think you can grab some CDs. You can always listen online. Then the last two weeks, week three and four, we talked about raising kids in a digital world. And uh, so some of you had asked for the graphics or the surveys that I have. If you're interested in that, we can email them to you. So if you just let me know on the way out or write your name on the back of a card or something, give it to me, we can email those to you. But uh, I think it was helpful on that. And so today we're going to talk about jobs, all right? So y'all ready for this? Here are some statistics doing a little bit of research. So in uh, February 2019, so that was just like last year, right? A survey, 80% of Americans don't like their job, okay, 80%. So that was the first one that caught my attention, right? And then I started kind of digging in a little bit deeper, came across this study, this guy says he studied uh, uh, the uh, jobs or people in workplaces for 15 years, so it's been kind of a survey he's been doing. And and so here's what his summary is, his thesis statement uh, of his long 15-year report. We spend about one-third of our days at work. Work defines us as people, i.e., when we're not happy at work, other areas of our life suffer. Quiet, right? All right. <clears throat> yet, uh, yet more than 70%, so he has 70%, 70% of workers say they are not satisfied or feel satisfied at, uh, at work or in their career choice. He concludes his survey and says, I believe that this is a serious ec- uh, epidemic uh, in America. And then I came across one that's like, wait, Pump the brakes, Pastor Dan. And it says employee, uh, employees don't hate their job. And I'm like, wait a minute. I mean, I just read all these articles about 80%, 70% don't like their job. So then I started reading his article, right? And as I got down toward about the middle of it, buried in the middle of it, here's what he says about people don't dislike their job, which is a, it, I think it was a headline to catch, my, uh, catch our attention. Here's what he says. 66% of Americans feel disengaged or actively disengaged in their job. And so here's what he writes. So despite the, uh, uh, because of the disengagement, people don't hate their job, they're not passionate about it, and they're just doing the bare minimum to stay employed. Right? So in other words, there's no passion, there's no excitement, we're just doing what we need to do to get through the review to keep our job, all right? Now, I don't need anybody to say amen or any of that stuff, because your boss may be watching online, all right? But I think we could probably all say that we at least know someone who's in a job situation where they're not happy about it, right? Right? And so as believers, the question I get is, you know, oftentimes it's like, you know, I feel like God's leading me somewhere else. I, when should I quit? How should I quit? And all that other kind of stuff. And, and so it's always kind of a complicated thing. How many of you know Johnny Paycheck? Raise your hand. Yeah. Uh, only a couple of you. He had a great song from like the 70s maybe. Something like, take this job and... <laughs> what? Shove it. Shove it. You can't say that in church. Usher, get this guy out of here. 
right? Yeah, I ain't working here no more, right? So, so sometimes we feel like that, right? Would you agree with that? And there's times like that that we feel like that. So how does our work environment fit into our spiritual life? Because I think what happens is too many believers think they're two separate things. I have my spiritual life and I have my secular life. The problem with that is the word secular is not in the Bible, right? In fact, as a Christ follower, you can't extract out your spiritual life from your other life because it's only your Christian life, right? Yes, someone ought to clap for that, right? And so what happens is we wrestle with it because we think that there's two separate categories and we have our Sunday morning time and our community group time and, you know, whatever it is in our work life that we're doing. And then we have our secular life. And so whether we're a stay-home mom, a stay-home dad, retired, a student, you're in your career journey right now, I want to share with you some thoughts about work in, in, in your environment in which you spend basically 40% of your life. At, okay, so if you will, at the very top of your outline, um, let, let's read the top of the outline. You guys ready? It's up on the board. Here it is. So God's goal for each of us would be that we would change to reflect the very image of Jesus, right? So as believers, that's got what, that's what God's goal is. Last week in the week two or week three and week four, I said, parents, your goal is to teach your kids responsibility, to train them to move out to move their dependence away from you to God. And as parents, that's the long-term goal. As believers, all of us, regardless of our age, God wants to change us, transform us into the image of Christ. And so if we take, say, 90,000 hours is what they, they suggest, uh, they, they say that the average person works in a career. Some of you feel like you worked that last week, right? <laughs> and, and so... 90,000 hours, if we exclude that from our life, if God's end game is to change us into the image of Christ and we exclude that from our life, think about, think about how much we're missing, right? So to think that God only wants to change me in church or in community group or in prayer group or whatever it is that we're involved in and not work would really be kind of crazy. 40% of your life. And so if his end game is to, to change you into the image of Christ, then he's going to use that, all right? So look with me in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. <clears throat> it says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as, uh, as sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of what, church? Worship, Worship right? So it doesn't say, and on Sunday only, right? But it says to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. So we are to do that on a regular basis, on a daily basis, on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, whether it's Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, whatever it is, we're to do that. Verse 2, do not conform any longer to the patterns of this, what's the word? World. world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Okay, so here's what I suggest and kind of my, my theory as to why we have 66% of people aren't passionate about their work, you know, 80% are unhappy, 70%, whatever the number is, it's a large number, all right? And here's the reason why I think it is. In your outline, especially amongst believers, in your outline, here is the world's view of work, and this is where we get, as believers, we get sucked into this, all right? And so how do we select a job? How do we look for work? How do we pick a vocation? And here's what we do. Great pay, great benefits, right? And we forget, and this is dangerous, this is dangerous. We forget that God is our provider, not the company that we work for, all right? Yes, yeah, so you ought to clap for that right? So, so when we recognize that God is the provider, the work is just honoring God and writing you a check. Isn't that nice of them, right? But God is our provider. So we, first thing we do is that, hey, got good pay, good benefits, right? Next thing is it, is it, is it a, a great opportunity? Is there growth in the company? Is there growth in the corporation? Is it easy? That's why I selected being a pastor. <laughs> Serious. Think about it. You guys work 90,000 hours a week, I work like a half an hour a week, 
That's it. And then the church grew and I had to do it again. So then I asked for overtime. It's like two hours a week. That's like too much. Just kidding. All right. I said that one time and somebody came out and asked me that. They go, do you really only work? And I'm like, yeah, come in my office. I'll show you how much I work. Way, way more than I want to admit to. Uh, next one is, so is it easy? All right. Then the last one is, they always need dot, dot, dot. Right? And so when, we, when, we, when we're looking for a career path, this is what we do. Is the pay good? Is the benefits good? Is it easy? You know, uh, is it always a need? Regardless, is it, is it recession-proof? Remember that from 2008, right? Is it recession-proof? And, and we get into that, and maybe the pay is good. Maybe the opportunities are great. Maybe all that stuff is good. But we end up feeling like we don't fit. And the reason why is because we're not bringing into the picture, the equation, our spiritual life. And we're picking it basically from the world's perspective or, or the world's point of view. So let me share with you some ideas on God's point of view. Number one, here's God's view of your work, all right? <clears throat> Letter A in your outline is God has designed you, God has designed me with talents, gifts, and interests that he wants uh, that he wants, you, wants used for his glory. So you have gifts, talents, and abilities and interest in your life that God wants you to use for his glory, okay? Now, that isn't just Sunday morning, right? That isn't just in church life. This is in life in general. He's given you gifts, talents, and abilities. And so if you have gifts, talents, and abilities and interests that are outside of the scope that you're working, you are a mismatch and you feel a sense of frustration. And personally, that's why I think 66% of the people aren't passionate about their work because they're not really, it's not something in their DNA that makes them drive that wants it. And for those of you who found your sweet spot, in your corporate world or in your work world, you, you know exactly what it is because you're excited about getting up on Monday and going to work. Not, you know, not that you don't have problems and headaches and all that kind of stuff, but, but, but you're excited about it because it's something that you're passionate about. And so in, a, in Ephesians chapter 2, um, verse 10, it says, for we are, what are we? We are God's workmanship. Right? And, and in the Greek, we get the word in the English, palm, you know, roses are red, violets are blue, or a, 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 a creation of art. Right? So it can, it can mean either thing. And, and so we have gifts, talents, and abilities that God has given us that's unique, that's different. And so if we go out and we look for the work like the world says, well, the pay is good, the benefit's good, it's a good corporation, good, good uh, upward mobility in that place, everyone always needs dot, dot, dot and it doesn't fit our, our giftedness, then we are kind of a, a, a we're, we're a mismatch. And as a result of it, we're going to feel a sense of, uh, of struggle in our life. Are you following so far? Letter B in your outline. Christ needs to be Lord of my life and Lord of my job. All right? Someone say amen to that. Amen. You've got to connect Sunday with Monday. Right? They, they have to go together. The worship, you know, on Sunday in a corporate setting has to carry over into Monday, and, and, and God needs to be Lord of our life. Now, now, I get this pushback. It's like, well, you know, my work says no religious things and all this other stuff. Hey, you don't necessarily have to have a sign that says Jesus is Lord of my cubicle, right? Although I say do it, let's get some lawyers involved and see if you have a right to that. I got a buddy in, Right? But you can have the mindset going in that, that this is God's place for you, a place of worship, right? Just as this might be a place of worship for you on Sunday, so, so it is in our life. Again, the secular thing, this, this idea that there's a secular life and a spiritual life is, is not really in a, a biblical view. It, it, it would be like this, right? It would be like this. So I'm married, right? And, and my wife is very lucky, why do you guys laugh when I say that? I'm just going to keep throwing it out there until someone says amen, right? All right. So, so anyway, I'm very fortunate that I, that I married up and my wife was very generous and gracious to me, right? So let... Yeah. Oh, man. Take this job, and. 
<laughs> so, so, so imagine this. So I walk in the, the, the living room. I come home from work, and she's in the, in the living room. And I say, hey, honey, how are you? Good, good, good. I said, you know, listen, this is the way it's going to work now. When we're at home, I'm going to act like we're married. She knows my wife. <laughs> and when I'm not at home, I'm not going to act like I'm married. Right? Thank you. <laughs> We're praying for world peace and Pastor Dan. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, that dog is not going to hunt very long in my house. Right? So, so my wife's not violent, but she can throw a skillet. On, <laughs> like a disc, right? Like a Frisbee. Right? So when we try to do that at home in our work life and we have our secular life and we have our spiritual life, it's the same thing. It doesn't work, right? The reality is I'm married. I'm married whether I'm at home. I'm married whether I'm out, you know, and about. I'm married, right? So it is in our, in our Christian life as well that, that, that we, God wants to be Lord of our life you know, and our job as well, and he wants to have that, and it's a mindset in which we carry into the work environment. That, that, that we do everything as unto the Lord, right? Regardless of the circumstances and situation and all that kind of stuff, that we do that. And so the first thing is, is God's view is he's given us gifts, talents, and abilities in our life. He wants us to sync up with that in our work environment. He wants to be Lord of our life, Lord of our job. Number two in your outline is God wants me to worship him through my work, right? So, it, so it's a carryover of Sunday, Right? We carry that over into, into the work environment in, in our life. And so as we're walking into work, again, it's that mindset that, that the presence of the Lord, Pastor Eric is always great to remind us that wherever we are, the presence of the Lord is with us. Right? He never leaves us nor forsakes us. And regardless of how crazy or toxic your work environment may be, when you step in, because the Spirit of God dwells within you, when you step into the environment, the presence of God is there. Right? That you are, you are carrying him everywhere you go, and you need to make sure that you have that mindset going in. Back to Romans 12, verse 1, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. So it's an ongoing daily, daily thing that we have. In your outline, worship is any time I express my love to God, right? So it isn't just when we're singing, but it's any time that we're, we're, we're living, it's any time that we're thinking, it's any time that we're express, expressing our love to God. Letter A in your outline, back to kind of the original thing, choosing a job that expresses your gifts and abilities that God has given you. That is a, a form of worship, that, that you are doing what God has created you to be and to do. In Romans six twelve, it says, uh, we have different gifts, right? We're not all the same, and this is the context of the church setting, but it, again, it also carries over into life, it's in our life individually, but according to the grace given us. And so if you are great at numbers, right, maybe you need to be an engineer, maybe you need to be an accountant, maybe you need to be a person who works with numbers. If you're great at words, you know, maybe it's something in, in English or, you know, those kinds of things, writing and that stuff. But you need to find that place. If you're great with working with your hands and figuring out problems, maybe it's in construction and doing, doing those kinds of things. Some of you are fantastic cooks, right? And I'm a fantastic eater. You ought to invite me over <laughs> more often. All right, and that's perfect. So I'm always hungry. So, so, but you need, to, you need to use it. So, so imagine if you are in a place where you're great with numbers and you're not doing anything in that area, it's a mismatch, right? It's a mismatch. I had a friend one time, he became a CPA, right? That's like the king of numbers. He hated numbers. He got a CPA, which is a, a difficult test to pass, he lasted one month, and he despised it. It's a mismatch, right? He thought, because the pay's good, it's always needed, da-da-da-da-da, and he got into it after spending six years into getting that. He got into it, and he realized that it wasn't part of who he was, right? So he ends up leaving, and he gets up into something else. But when we select our, our, our career path, 
based on what the world says, then the chances are us gonna, you know, we're going to be in a, in a mismatch in our life. Okay, so I already know what the question is because I get this question probably five or six times a year. I feel God is leading me out of the work that I'm doing into something else. This message is not about going in tomorrow to work and quitting. All right? I have staff meeting on Tuesday. I don't have time to hear from your spouse. All right? So this is not about going in and saying, that's it, I quit. Right? Now, some of you may feel led that way, and God may be working in that way. But you have to have a plan to exit. And it's not responsible to walk in and say, hey, I quit kind of thing when you have other responsibilities. Do you get that? Did everyone hear Pastor Dan say that? Yes, yeah, okay. So I, I don't want to have any spouse who's not here, you know, call me on Tuesday. You told them to quit, right? Do you know how much we, you know, right? I, I don't want to hear that. But, but I think it's true that if you're frustrated with it, then you need to make sure that you begin to have a plan out of it. I remember back when, before I got in the ministry and God was working in, in, my, in a calling into my life into the ministry, I remember literally laying on the bed before I would go to work, somehow thinking about how I could call in sick without lying because I hated the job. Because God, I was, I was a mismatch at that time. God had taken me in a different direction and it, wasn't, it just wasn't a good fit. You know, and it's like you're laying there. You remember like in third grade, it's like, I, I, think, I think I have a sore throat. <laughs> right? Do you, you ever do that? Remember like in third grade? Huh? Take the thermometer, put it on the light bulb. Yeah, and your mom's like, wow, you got a temperature, 208. <laughs> right? Do you ever try that? Rub it on the sheets. Anybody do that? Yeah? No? You guys didn't do any of that? You guys are too good. All right. <laughs> I did all that stuff and more. <laughs> all right. So back to the idea that, that when we get the pattern, when we're selecting it based on the pattern of the world, then we find ourselves in trouble. All right. So you got that so far. All right. Now I'm going to just talk in general. And this is one of the areas where I think that we completely miss, even if you love your job. Okay, even if you, you feel like you're using your gift in this and you're in the right place, you're seated in the right seat, everything is wonderful. We have to recognize that God is going to use your work to conform you into the image of Christ. All right, 40% of your life, 90,000 hours. And if you're retired, God's still going to conform you and He's going to use a different type of thing, maybe volunteer or grandkids, or along those lines, he's still going to do that, right? He's going to change us. He's going to transform us into the image of God. And he's going to use work. And for some of you, this is going to make complete sense because you come home frustrated and stressed out and you're, you're, you know, all those people and the boss and, you know, all this other stuff and you're just full of rage and anger, because you don't recognize what God's doing. And so what ends up happening is you finally pull a Johnny paycheck and you tell the boss, take this job and shove it. And then you go to another company and guess what you find there? The same thing. The same exact thing. His name isn't Gary, it's Bob, right? It's not Susan, it's Karen, right? It's the same personalities. It's the same responsibility. It's the same knucklehead bosses. It's the same ownership. It's the same all that stuff. Because God is working in your life to teach you something. And so instead of us walking around the mulberry bush, you know, over and over and over, we pause, we recognize that God is going to use our vocation to shape and mold us, all right? So let's take a look at this, and some of you may end up loving your job by the time you leave, all right? So let's take a look. Number three in your outline. So what God wants to do in my life, he wants to grow me spiritually through my work, all right? He wants to grow me spiritually through my work. Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be what, church? Conformed to the likeness of his son, right? So we're back to the very beginning of what God wants to do. So we think that spiritual growth or spiritual formation is at church on Sunday, it is in community group whenever we're in a community group. It's in next steps, right? It's on a serve team. That's a part of it. Just think about this. 
if you come to church every Sunday, which by the way, most people don't, you're talking about four to five hours a, week, uh, a month. If you throw in community group, right, the Bible study time of a community group is probably 35 to 45 minutes, right? So now, now you're looking at maybe six, seven hours. If you're on a serve team, add another three or four hours to that, maybe 11, 12 hours a month for spiritual formation. If God uses your work, that's 40 hours, and for, for many people, plus a week, to transform us, right? And so why would God exclude that? See, he wouldn't. He would, he would have it a, a, a part of your formation in your life. And so in your work environment, here's what's gonna happen. God is going to use, letter A in your outline, God is gonna use pressure at work to teach you responsibility because God cares more about your character than he cares about your comfort. And God's end game is to transform you into the image of Christ. And so how's he going to do that? He's going to put demands on your life where you're going to feel like you're stressed, why you're, you know, the pressure, you're pushed, you're, 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 you're stretched in all those different areas to teach you how to be responsible. And he wants to develop you to be a yes is yes and a no is no person. Right? Too many believers are yes, which may be maybe, but probably not. Right? And he says, hey, let your yes be your yes and your no your no. And so you're going to have opportunities where the boss is going to walk in and the supervisor, whatever, however your structure works in your, in your organization, and they're going to come in and they're going to say, hey, you need to do. And then you need to make a decision. Is it yes or is it no? And if you say yes, you got to make it happen. Right? Because that's how you're going to end up showing that you are responsible in your life. So you're going to have promises that you need to keep. You're not going to be the person in the work environment where everyone wants to blame everyone else. Those people drive me crazy. Will someone please take responsibility for something? Right? It's like, right? Never me. And so we, we want to be a people that take responsibility. And so we have to keep our promises. H how about this? How about when the boss isn't around, that you actually do your work? What a concept, right? What, an, what a concept that is. And so when the boss is gone, what is it? When the, when the boss is gone, the mice will play or something like that. I don't know what, what it is. You know, one of those types of things. And, and so it's like, wh why would we do that? If, if Jesus is Lord of our life and he's Lord of our work, our boss never leaves. He's always there, right? Yeah, clap. And so we need to make sure that, that that's, you know, that's part of who we are in our life. And then you can jot this down. This is kind of a little side note. How about controlling cost? What a concept. Hello, federal government, right? <laughs> Write this down. Or state government or city government or anything government. Just, just jot this passage down. You can go home and read it later. Luke chapter 16, verse 11 and 12, right? Let me summarize it. Here's what it says. If you're not responsible with worldly wealth, believers, why do you think God is going to trust you with heavenly wealth? He's not, right? The acid test of our faithfulness is how we handle worldly wealth, and God is going to put you in a place in your work environment where you're in charge of budgets or finances or whatever the case may be. And how are you going to use that? Are you going to be responsible or are you not going to be responsible? And so God is going to place us in those environments in our work where he's going to say, hey, I want to develop you. I want you to have, be a person that is responsible in your work environment. Right? And so God is going to put us in those places. Letter B in your outline is God is going to use people at work to teach you about relationships. All right? Write that word down and then, look, or two words, then look up here. You ready? You are crazy to think that God is not going to send crazy people into your life. All right? Not everyone can work with me. He's going to send nut jobs into your work environment. Right? 
and you're going to wonder how in the world they can figure out how to get to work, <laughs> right? How they can tell time, how they know where their desk is at, how they finish the projects that are given, right? Because those, the, that's, that's how God is going to teach you how to love unlovable te- people, Right? Anyone can love lovable people. I mean, just look at me. That's why my wife is so lucky, right? But it's hard to love unlovable people. Would you agree with that, right? So God is going to bring crazy people, nut job people, personality flawed people, just like you, by the way, into your work environment, right? And how are you going to deal with them? How are you going to have, have that relationship with you? So this is from a while ago. I had it in my notes from, from it, uh, types of uh, people. I did this in a, in a relational uh, sermon one time. But here's the type of people that you're going to work with. You're going to work, work with pushy people, right? They're called Sherman tanks. That's an old term. That's a World War II thing. But you know what I'm talking about. They're going to come in like bulldozers. <laughs> right? And that's going to be the type of person that you're going to work with. How are you going to deal with that? How are you going to deal with the person that never stops talking, right? Please, to the glory of God, clam it, please, right? You with me on that? It's like yakety, 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 yak. It's like, no wonder you don't get any work done. It never stops. Same into that. And then how about the negative person, right, that no matter what goes on, I mean, you could find eight pounds of gold and they would complain about something, right? They're just always, and then you have the the, the person that throws the temper tantrum all the time. It's part of their control and their insecurity thing. They walk in and they're always ready to blow a fuse. You're not sure how to deal with them. And if if it's a person that's in a, a, a similar position as you and you have to pass on work to them, you know that that's not gonna go well. It's like, excuse me, this is your job. My job! You know, like that kind of thing. It's like, okay, all right, just take some, uh, some medicine there for you. <clears throat> or you end up not giving it to them, right? You're just like, forget it. I don't even want to deal with that person. I'm just going to do it myself. Uh, and then you have the crybaby person, and, you know, that's how they can manipulate and all that stuff. The nitpicker person, and then the one I love is the space cadet, and that's the one where, you know, you scratch your head, and it's like, man, I am surprised that dude could find his car in a parking lot with one car parked there, right? <laughs> you, have you ever dealt with those kind of people? I mean, you give them some, it's like, hello, earth to so-and-so. <laughs> Houston, we got a problem. This, this, guy's a, this guy's messed up. And so God is going to place those people into your life, right? Regardless of what job, whether you're volunteering, whether you're a stay-at-home mom, you're a PTA, whatever the case is, God is going to put nut jobs into your life to teach you how to love unlovable people, right? And, and it's, it's going to grind on you. And I oftentimes will say, hey, if you think God isn't intentional about bringing those kinds of people in your life, you don't understand the God that I worship. Because the end game is to mold me into the image of Christ, right? And part of that is to love unlovable people. And so in Romans chapter 12, it's a good verse for some of you, live in harmony with one another. And we all say amen if it was that easy. Skip down to verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on who? You. So there's going to be some people that are just impossible, right? And you know that, but you still have to kind of have, have that uh, relationship with them. Then letter C in your outline is that God is going to use problems at work to teach me character, right? God is going to use problems at work to teach me character. <clears throat> Again, Romans 5 verse, eight, uh, verse 3 says this, <clears throat> uh, but we also rejoice in our suffering, right? Shall I read that again? but we also rejoice in our suffering. Shall I read it again? But we also rejoice in our suffering because, and here's the why part, because we know that suffering produces, what does it produce? And perseverance produces, and character produces, hope, right? Verse five, and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love in our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. And, and so it's that perseverance, right, through suffering that is going to build our character 
in our life. It's always interesting to hear how people think spiritual growth happens. We think that spiritual growth, and those of you who've been through Next Steps, you know I, I give you a circle, but you think that spiritual growth is linear, meaning that it starts here, I, I give my life to Jesus, and I end here, maturity. But it doesn't work that way. It's a circle. And there are seasons in our spiritual growth. And the, the, the most spiritual growth that we experience is when we go through broken times, right? And oftentimes in our life, we're kind of kicking along and everything seems to be okay and we're just kind of, you know, God's good, it's all good, everything's going well. And then we go into a difficult, dark season in our life, a brokenness, right? You know, it could be a loss of job, a broken relationship, financial issues, a health issue, someone you care about having some type of issue. And all of a sudden, it kind of restarts our spiritual growth. Well, well, that's what Romans 5 is, right? Romans 5 is that God's gonna allow trouble, allow, not necessarily cause, allow troubles in our life to, again, kickstart our spiritual growth, again. Because we do not grow when we're sitting back, relaxing, and everything is good. We grow spiritually in adverse times. The church, historically, not just in the United States, but in other countries, grows the most when it's oppressed, right? When the church is cruising along and everything's good, there's not revival that takes place. It's when there's oppression, when the government is against it, when the church is going through difficult times, we see great movements of God. And and that's because in difficult times, right, when we persevere, it begins to develop our character, ultimately gives us hope, and God is in the work in the midst of what takes place. And so in our own life, when it comes to work and it comes to problems, you drive home, and this is the wrong thing to do. I'm so sick and tired of it. There's all these problems and Highway 4 is jammed up and Vasco's a nightmare and blah, 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 and Pastor Dan works a half an hour a week and it's not fair, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and you're complaining, but, but here, here's what I would suggest you do. You ask God what the lesson is that you, that you need to learn from the problem, right? Because he's trying to teach you a lesson. Now, you may not be the cause of the lesson, right? No one's saying it's your fault, but he is trying to transform you into the image of Christ. And so we want to pause and we want to ask God, God, why is this going on in this work environment, in, this, in my job? that I'm going through this type of struggle. And so if you think about the fruit of the Spirit, you know, you have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you think that God wants to teach those into our life, which is a picture of Jesus, right? It's one fruit, but it's a picture of Christ. He is gonna put you around unlovable people to teach you love, right? If it's joy, Joy is not happiness. Happiness is a, is a Latin, it comes from a Latin word happenstance, which means it's circumstance driven. So when the circumstances are good, happy, right? Joy is internal joy, which means that there's a peace that passes all understanding, even in the midst of chaos, right? And if you don't think that God is going to put you in a crazy place, to teach you how to have joy in your life regardless of the circumstances, you're crazy. And he is going to use your work environment for that, very, for that very reason in your life. Peace, the same type of thing. He's going to put you in chaotic situations. Patience, he's going to stick you on Highway 4. <laughs> and you're going to watch all the people drive by in the diamond lane with one person. And you're going to pray to the name of Jesus that there would be nine highway patrolmen at the end of the line, and you're going to see a hundred of them getting $500 tickets, and you drive there, and they don't. And you wonder where the goodness of God is at. Because as soon as you get in there, there's a highway patrol. He lights you up like that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I know, I hang out there. I, I stand at the BART tracks and I just watch my people drive by. Yeah. We, we, put, we, have, we have a, trust me, we're like the CIA but different, all right? We have little sensors in all of your cars. I know exactly where you're at. I track you all over the place. Some of you last night, boy, I'm telling you. Just kidding, just kidding. 
We don't do that. I, I hardly know where my car's at, and that's why I park in the same spot all the time when I go to the store, because I'm the guy that like, earth the Dan, earth the Dan. All right. Patience. He's going to jam you up on Highway 4. Faith, right? You, you know what he's going to do in faith? And this, this, is, this is so true, especially for some of you on commission, right? And I hear this all the time. You know, somebody in the company said if we just wrote this down on the paper, you know, we would meet the sales quota and everything would be okay and all that kind of stuff. But it's not true, right? And God is going to put you in places like that to see whether you're faithful, to see if you have the integrity, to say, I'm not going to say that, but I'm going to believe that God is my provider regardless, right? And so he's going to put us in those kinds of places where we go through, you know, difficult times in our work. And so if you begin to see work from a different perspective, that God's end game is to disciple you and to be, shape and mold you into the image of Christ, he's going to use your work environment to do that. Now let me wrap up. Let me reiterate. If you're in a misfit job, Pastor Dan did not say quit tomorrow. Pastor Dan said, come up with a plan to get out of that profession and get into something that you feel more passionate about. If you're looking at a career, do not look at the benefits whether the job is something that's always needed. Look at your own spiritual giftedness and then find a career path that fits into that where you will be passionate about your job. Because when you find that, I'm telling you, it changes just the whole way you look at your work environment and you're not working to get a paycheck to have the weekends off, but it's something that you're passionate about, that you love. It's not perfect. Right? There's no such thing as a perfect environment except in heaven, but it's, it's a place that you find where you fit in. All right, you all with me on that? And then we're going to wrap up. We're going to go home. God's goal for each of us uh, would be that we would be, again, changed to reflect the very nature or the image of Christ. And that is God's end game for every single one of us. So let's pray. Father, thank you for just this opportunity and just uh, kind of the laughter and the fun, and we enjoy that, yet at the same time we recognize that there's a sense of seriousness to that. Lord, when, when such a large number of folks are dissatisfied with work, I know that it affects the home life. And God, I pray for each of the folks who are here today who feel, feel like maybe they're, they're a misfit in their work environment. Father, I pray that you will give them wisdom and discernment to find that place of service, that the vocation that you desire. God, I pray that you'll begin to set forth the steps that are necessary to ultimately fulfill that plan that you desire for them. And Lord, may we recognize that work isn't gonna be perfect and that your desire is to grow us in the midst of that. And Lord, help us to take a step back, take a deep breath, and really ask you, what are you trying to teach me in the midst of those chaotic and crazy times? And again, Father, thank you for just your love. Thank you that you desire to shape and mold us and to use the work environment for that very purpose. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed as we wrap up, maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ and we always want to end with that. And we do the little ABC. It's not a formula. It's just the way we track it. A is admit that we're sinners, that we've all missed the mark. B is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on a cross, that he rose again and see is to confess him to be your Lord and Savior. And if you're here today and you've never made that decision, as I say this prayer, I just pray that you would pray along with me silently, not out loud, silently, just repeat after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, today, I admit that I'm a sinner, that I've missed the mark. And I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on a cross, that he rose again. And today I confess him to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me, Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me a brand new creation in Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said.